Good morning, and thank you very much for coming to Toronto Police Headquarters. Today, I'd like to introduce to you Chief Mark Saunders and Inspector Don Belanger of the Toronto Drug Squad. They are here to speak to us about the results of three gun and drug investigations. Chief. Thank you, Victor. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. So I'm pleased to share with you the results of three investigations uh, that have been done by the Organized Crime Enforcement Unit, uh, drug section, uh, specifically Project Topside and Project Sparta 2, which was done by the major project section, as well as the third investigation was done by the street level enforcement teams. All three of these investigations took a period of two months, and as you can see by everything here, uh, this was incredibly successful. And when I speak about successful, it speaks specifically to the street gang entities which I've spoken about in the past. And when we talk about uh, what we need to do to help reduce, eliminate the street gang is remove the incentives that are involved. So first and foremost, when we look at all of this, there is money to be made. So when we cut into the profit margin, then we know that we help reduce what they're trying to get. And secondly, when you look at the amount of drugs that are here, uh, which affects so many members of our community who are vulnerable uh, by removing the supply, that helps. And the third is when you look at the firearms that are here, including we have some silencers and other things. Um, one less gun helps prevent an opportunity for a street gang member to use it and invoke harm in our city. Inspector Don Belanger from the drug section will be speaking uh, with respect at a granular level as to the investigation itself, the charges that are laid, and the amount of work that was involved by the drug teams. And I just personally want to say thank you to not just the drug squad for the fantastic work that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to the men and women of the Toronto Police Service that uh, every day go out there and do their best to keep our city safe. Um, you can see that this is the lifeblood of street gangster culture. They're in it for the money, and any time we can disrupt that money, uh, we help uh, deter uh, more people from wanting to get into the industry, and also we can help save lives. Uh, almost every day we're seizing guns from the streets, and uh, this is an example of a coordinated effort and work done by specialists in this type of line. And without further ado, a very knowledgeable person when it comes to street gang subculture and drug enforcement, Inspector Don Belanger. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. I'm going to be speaking about three separate drug investigations this morning, which I will go through chronologically. I'm going to start by echoing the comments of Chief Saunders in commending the members of our major project section, as well as the members of our street level enforcement teams in the Klan Lab Unit who assisted the majors in their investigations. An enormous amount of work goes into achieving results like these. This work, as you can appreciate by the firearms that are on display here today, is dangerous, but it also requires a superior level of commitment. And I'm extremely appreciative of the dedication and the professionalism demonstrated by our drug squad investigators. I'd also like to acknowledge members of intelligence services and our auto squad officers for their contributions and for their ongoing support to our investigations. I'll begin with Project Sparta, which is led by the major project section. Some of you will recall a news conference from January for Project Sparta where three individuals were charged and where multiple kilos of controlled substances were seized, including 68 kilos of cocaine. Project Sparta II was a continuation of the original investigation. In late September, specifically September 20th, it resulted in the arrests of four additional individuals and the execution of multiple search warrants on addresses and vehicles. The addresses are located downtown as well as in North York. These search warrants resulted in the seizure of the items you see here on my left, on the table here. <clears throat> specifically, a pistol grip 12 gauge shotgun over seven and a half kilos of powder cocaine, close to one kilo of fentanyl, over eight kilos of illegal cannabis, as well as smaller quantities of crack, MDMA, ketamine, and Xanax. Also seized as part of Project Sparta II was just over $190,000 in cash. 
that we allege to be proceeds of criminal activity. And again, you can see the cash on the table here. The following individuals, all of Toronto, are charged with numerous drug and proceeds related offences and two have been jointly charged in relation to the seized firearm. Uh, incidentally, you will get uh, copies of all the names with the proper spellings, of course, and the charges that each one faces. Nikolai Knights, 32 years. Jonathan Dond, 37 years. Lisa Corman Shaw, 38 years. And Naritama D'Souza, 30 years. These individuals were all released on bail and will next appear at the Old City Hall Courthouse on November the 30th, sorry, November 29th. Moving to Project Topside, the items in front of me here and to my right, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, once again, our major project section commenced Project Topside in September. It focused on a male who was believed to be trafficking cocaine at the multi-kilo level. Information indicated that the male was based in the east end of Toronto with ties throughout the GTA. As Project Topside progressed, investigators came to believe that those involved not only had access to large quantities of cocaine, but that they also had access to illicit firearms. On Octo October 24th and 25th, search warrants were executed at three addresses and on three vehicles in Scarborough and in Markham. As a result, investigators located the following controlled substances. Almost four kilos of powder cocaine, over a kilo of crack cocaine, close to four kilos of heroin, and more than a kilo of fentanyl. And you can see uh, the fentanyl on the table here to my right is uh, multicolored. Additionally, more than $200,000 in cash was seized. I can advise that the vast majority of this cash, again, I'm talking $200,000, was seized from one accused individual when he was arrested while walking to his vehicle. We allege that all of this money is proceeds from gun and drug sales. With respect to the firearms, there were 12 seized in Project Topside. Of the 12, four are semi-automatic pistols, five are revolvers, and three are rifles, including one submachine gun that uh, is the bottom gun on this rack to my right, which has the ability to uh, be fired in an automatic fashion. It's worth noting that nine of the 12 guns were loaded and ready to be fired when located by our officers. Investigators also seized hundreds of rounds of ammunition, a replica Glock pistol, a bulletproof vest, and two firearms silencers, as well as additional firearm magazines, including a loaded drum magazine that would allow somebody to fire 50 rounds consecutively. Also of interest is the fact that 11 of the guns and all of the seized drugs were found in a hidden trap, an aftermarket compartment built into one of the vehicles, which was a 2010 Ford Escape. And we're just gonna show a video here of this trap being opened. This sophisticated trap was wired into the vehicle and it operated using hydraulics. It contained significant amount of controlled substances and firearms. To date, there have been two males arrested in relation to Project Topside. Imran Marah, 31 years of Stouffville. Kadeem Marah, 28 years also of Stouffville face numerous gun, drug, and proceeds related charges. Their next court appearance will be at the Toronto East Courthouse on November the 13th. A third male remains at large and is wanted in relation to these charges. An arrest warrant has been obtained for Nicholas Reed, R-E-I-D, 27 years of Markham. Mr. Reed's photo will be displayed momentarily. Anyone with information on the whereabouts of Nicholas Reed is asked to contact investigators at 416-808-6100. That's 416-808-6100. And as always, Crime Stoppers can be contacted anonymously. I encourage Mr. Reed to contact his lawyer and to turn himself in today at any police station. Finally, and most recently this past weekend, 
Members of our street level enforcement teams continued an investigation into a male who was believed to be distributing cocaine at the multi ounce level. On the evening of November 2nd, three search warrants were executed in the Lakeshore and Parklawn area. As a result, investigators located and seized just over six kilos of powder cocaine, which is being displayed on the screen now. Raman Karimi, 36 years of Toronto, was arrested and charged with possession for the purpose of trafficking cocaine. He appeared at the Old City Hall Courthouse yesterday and was released on bail. His next court appearance is on December 20th at Old City Hall. In summary, in addition to the obvious significance of the firearm seizures, when you take the combined total of these three investigations, our drug teams have removed what could have amounted to $3.7 million worth of illicit drugs from our streets, along with just under $400,000 in cash. And with that, if there are any questions, I can entertain those. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the more than $200,000 in cash that was seized? You said that that was um, from the sale of guns and drugs. What kind of drugs, how much drugs, how many guns was this guy allegedly selling to get that amount of cash? And I'm assuming it's all in one transaction? He had $200,000 on his person. <clears throat> and it's our allegation that, that that money is entirely proceeds of drug sales, high, high level drug sales, obviously, and as well as uh, the trafficking of firearms. In one transaction? No, I'm not gonna suggest in one transaction, likely multiple transactions. Transactions in one day, though, like for somebody to be carrying around that amount of cash, I would be speculating on that. Uh, maybe a question for the chief. Obviously, there's been a, a major emphasis on uh, uh, drugs and gangs. And these, I know, I recognize that these are three separate um, investigations from Project Community Space, which has obviously been in the news a lot. But how, how does this this bust, um, you know, how significant is it to the overall fight against uh, drugs and, and gangs going on right now? Well, it's our new reality when it comes to street gang subculture. This is a monetary enterprise. Uh, their motivation is money. Uh, from recent projects done by the major drug squads and the street level drug squads, what we see is that there's a high profit margin. Uh, the takedowns we've had in the past, we're talking about million dollar, uh, millions of dollars uh, being gained through um, illicit means. Now, when we translate that in, in real time, when we look at our body counts of people that have been shot, the people that have been murdered uh, by a gun activity, uh, we correlate most of the, the shooting occurrences in our city uh, to, to gun violence. And we correlate absolutely almost all of our gun activity to street gangs. So it is a business enterprise that uses firearms as one of their tools in their business transactions to protect their environment, to invoke fear and intimidation uh, around the communities, and it's all for this. So when, when our drug squads and our, our other agent entities uh, have these takedowns, we take away the number one driver, which is profit. Um, it sends a signal that we have people that are out there that are enforcing, that are uh, moving the needle in the right direction. But the problem is we, we have, uh, for every one we take down, there are a multitude more uh, street gang members that are out there that are doing the very same thing. Do you, do you foresee a dip in the number of shootings as a result of this project or status quo given that this has been happening over several months and there's still a lot of shootings happening? Well, we've, pre we've prevented opportunities. So when you look at guns, when you look at you know, guns that can shoot fully automatic, when we look at guns that, uh, with silencers, uh, we have removed the opportunity for these guns to be used for shooting and killing people, uh, invoking uh, harm and fear within our communities, and the same thing with the drugs. Uh, there's a lot of talk of, of, of how much uh, drug usage has affected the quality of life within our communities. Uh, that is right out there front and center. By removing the supply, uh, I'm not, it doesn't solve everything to matter, but what it, what it does do is it makes a couple of statements. Number one, we're there, we're enforcing. Uh, number two, I'm hoping for strong deterrent factors so anyone that's sitting on the fence whether or not to get involved in the street gang subculture uh, because of the money, uh, we will act as that deterrent. But in order to get this right, there have to be a multitude of agencies and entities that work with us to make this right, especially on the back end of things when the men and women do a tremendous amount of work. Uh, that deterrent factor is critical for the large-scale types of investigations 
investigations, so the incarceration piece, uh, the bail piece when it comes to certain issues involving firearms specifically, uh, it, it's always going to be a concern. So we, we won't arrest our way out of this. We'll do what we need to do. And, and looking at this in a two-month period of time, the drug squad was able to, to have some tremendous results here. Can you, can you just expand on that whole bail issue? Because the inspector mentioned, did you say that all of the accused are now out on bail? Can I just clarify that first? Or were you just speaking to the specific? Uh, for the three investigations, all are out on bail with the exception of two. Which are the two that are not on bail? Uh, the two Marat brothers. And, and what sort of allegations are they facing? <clears throat> the allegations they're facing are in relation to the uh, firearms and the drugs that you see in front of me and to my right. Do you have, I mean, any idea why those two would have been denied bail, assuming that they applied for bail and the others were released? Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. So, Chief, then, if you can comment on the fact that all but two people in a gun and drug investigation are out on bail, this is a message that you are often repeating. Yeah, the message that I'm often repeating, and I'll be very clear so that it doesn't get misconstrued, it's people that have been apprehended for firearms offenses charges. I'm not going to uh, make any statements with respect to the bail system as a whole. But, you know, the, when we talk to the communities and their concerns, when it comes to firearm-related charges, um, are we satisfied with the, with the present stance, the status quo? Or does the community need a stronger lens in that courtroom? Uh, I can tell you at the town halls, uh, they have a different view. They have concerns with, with that factor. And when we talk about the frontline men and women, when they're doing a tremendous amount of work when it comes to firearms types of investigations, and, and bail is something that is happening, uh, invoking the conversation on is, is, is this where we need to go with community, uh, community safety, or do we need to have a sit down and a, a candid conversation and what the communities are really asking for? Do you think, Chief Saunders, I mean, we do so many shooting stories, we talk to so many community residents who every day are saying they don't feel safe in their community. Do you think looking at this, should they feel safer today? What, do you, what reaction are you expecting to get from them? What, what do you want to get from them with this announcement? Well, this, this, is, this is not the, the silver lining to everything. This is just one of many investigations that the drug squad does in a year, and they do a fantastic job. Uh, we have to recognize that we live in a city of three million people. And, and the first and foremost thing that I've always said, that if, if you're not involved in, in high-risk lifestyle, then in, in large, you're generally safe. But I will say there are certain areas of our communities where gun activity is very high. And there needs to be a collective approach, not just arresting your way out of it. Uh, year to date, we've arrested over 700 people for firearms-related offenses, over 700. So we're looking at twice a day, we're arresting people for firearm offenses. We're not going to arrest our way out of it. Our enforcement piece is very strong, very robust. I have great investigators, and I've got great men and women out in the road doing their work. But if we're not supported by the other entities, the at-risk piece, as well as the back end, the high-risk piece, um, then, then we're going to continue to do what we're doing. And the numbers are going to remain the same, if not increase, because of the mon monetary aspects that are involved in, in, in this industri industry. Where are, you, where are you speaking to right now in terms of, like, we've done our job, yeah. you know, you do yours? Well, I can, all three levels of government, I've had many conversations, and they're, they're looking for um, assistance in, in what are the various things that can be done at the at-risk piece as well as at the high-risk piece. So it's not that I'm not getting uh, cooperation. I certainly would hope that there's an opportunity that, that we all have the ability of moving towards action. Uh, we're 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're continuous action. We are nonstop. Uh, now if we can have those uh, larger, broad-scale conversations on, on discussing the social piece to this whole equation and then figuring out what we do at that front end and what do we do at that back end, but if all three pockets are not equally addressed, then, then we're going to continue this cycle, and there'll be more people that will be shot, and there'll be homicides. Chief, uh, Chief just to follow up on what said about the, on the bail question, I mean, I, I recognize you're not going to uh, speak specifically on it as a whole, but uh, on this broader conversation about speaking with the federal government, I mean, bail issues and something the mayor's talked about, and we've heard it a little bit in the election as well. I mean, are you encouraged at... Uh, at the discussion specifically around bail, I mean, as mentioned, all but two are out. Um, are, are you encouraged? Do you see signs that a, a more robust conversation about potentially changing the bail system is on the way? I mean, are you encouraged overall? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm encouraged by the discussions, but I want action. I mean, the words are great, but at the end of the day, what are the deliverables? And, and we are doing our deliverable piece. Uh, so working with the agencies, it does start with discussion, but the sooner the discussion moves to action, and, and then, then we've, we've got a, a very good story to, to discuss. So we're not quite there yet. How tough is it to get the threshold to have someone remanded? Um, how tough is it to get that threshold lowered? Well, you know, that's, uh, I'm not going to speak out of, out of my wheelhouse. I'll, I'll stick with the enforcement piece because that keeps me safer. Um, that's, that's another discussion with, with other agencies to have. Um, we will do what we do best, which is, is do that enforcement piece uh, in accordance to law with rule of law. And we do our best to bring it towards the judicial system in, in the best, most prepared fashion, as this case will be as well. Once it enters into the um, office of the court, uh, that's another discussion with another level of people. To, to figure that line out. Switching gears a little bit to, to what's actually on the table here. Um, before the presser started, I went around and shot everything. Yeah. And to me, the scariest thing on this table is the fentanyl. Um, apparently, a few grains kill a person. There's bags and bags and bags of it there. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, how dangerous it is, how, uh, the proliferation of using this drug either uh, straight or to cut it? Uh, into other drugs to make them more powerful and, uh, you know, the amount of people who are being picked up off the street uh, or having <coughs> being naloxone lying in, on the sidewalks of Toronto. Well, there, there lies our, our, our new issue and our new concern. So by using fentanyl to cut the other drugs, when you take a brick of cocaine where you used to cut it three times and it would be diluting it, you're cutting it five times and, and you're still uh, creating that, that, that state of euphoria when you purchase it. And um, so now the profit margin has expanded tremendously. And, and so it is an issue, it is a concern, and, and we're focused on all aspects of this. Our, our eye isn't on one specific, it's on everything, but it speaks to the narrative and, and the, the existence of the street gang subculture now. It's not just about protecting territory. The monetary aspects to it are far great right now, and the incentives to be involved are high. And, and one of the causes is because there's lots more money to be made either on the drug end or going to a gun show in the States and purchasing something for $400, bringing it here, selling it for $4,000, or for the human trafficking. So all three streams play an equal part in why we have what we have today. And, and our drug squad is knocking off one end of it. And you can see the drug investigation leads into the gun investigation, which then leads into the street gang subculture piece. So all of the dots connect uh, really strongly. It's a narrative that we've all spoke on, we've all discussed, and we've also recommended the solutions to all aspects of the agencies that are across our city that can play a part in, in helping reduce this. Can we switch to another service now? Really quickly. Time for two more questions. Okay, uh, Chief. Uh, if you know, just on a couple other investigations that are going on, um, in terms of the the hallway shooting um, that you're speaking on, uh, one of the three suspects of which was who was arrested, and I remember the night of you were saying that it was believed that this case could be solvable. I'm just wondering if there's any sort of update on the outstanding suspects in that case. If there's any progress being made, uh, as well as the overall project community space. If there's any update on uh, more arrests, uh, any more indication on funding if it's going to be extended. If you could speak on those two things, if there's any updates to either of those two situations. So, so speaking on community, uh, community space, uh, we ended week 12, which is when the, the, the final date of the actual project ended, which was November 4th. Um, I'll be receiving the results on that fairly soon. Uh, I can tell you we, we have made more arrests, we have done more bail uh, compliance checks, and so those numbers will be coming out very shortly. Um, the, the existing funds will continue with community space, and after that, I'll make an announcement on what all of the results are and what the go-forward is going to look like. So if we could just hold off on that. Uh, with the, uh, the hallway shooting where our five uh, young people were shot, um, I believe that there may be an announcement a little bit later on with respect to an update, I'm not sure. So uh, I will uh, definitely, if there is more to be said, then that will be said later on. Um, but uh, through a lot of hard work with the investigative teams who are out there who do fantastic jobs, they're able to make an apprehension, uh, which, which again, I think is w we are holding our end of the line. We've made a multitude of arrests um, with, with what we're doing with the resources that we have. And it's, it's done through a lot of great work and commitment from the frontline people as well as our folks that are in the specialized entities specific to street gangs of culture. How, how much do these shootings have to do with the drug trade? And how much do they have to do with the fact that more people, according to your own intelligence in recent years, are carrying guns 
on the street. And so when one guy gets shot, then they go back and forth and tit for tat. Yep. And we see these certain neighborhoods where there's a ton of shootings in another neighborhood. Yep. Like how much is it back and forth and how much is it just territory? It's tons. So talking about the high risk lifestyle again. Uh, I certainly can speak to when I was working in homicide because the narrative has not changed. When we deal with the street gang subculture, when you as an investigator show up at a homicide and you see someone that has been murdered and you know that he belongs to a specific uh, street gang, 90% uh, of the time you know exactly who is going to get shot next, who is going to get murdered next. And we see this happening over and over and over again, and this has happened for a long, long time. The only thing now is that we're seeing uh, a level of brazenness that's a little bit different. The transition and the fact that it's not about protecting territory, it's about creating an, an enterprise that is making money, uh, has now created stronger incentives for people to move towards that street gang subculture. And, and so that's kind of the difference that has changed over the past few years. And I will say that I think fentanyl has played a, a, a very strong uh, 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 hook in why that narrative has changed. The money to be made is substantial. And, and so walking away from it is hard, which is why I say again, it has to be collective if we're going to get this right. We are not going to be arresting our way out of this anytime soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Inspector. Thank you, media, for coming today. That concludes today's conference. Our news release will be out if it's not out already. Thank you.